If you would, please join me in praying to the God of your choice or none at all while listening to the words of Mother Teresa who said, people are often unreasonable and self-centered, forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives, be kind anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat, cheat you, be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous, be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow, do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see in the end, it is between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Commissioner Denning. Here. Commissioner Nash. Here. Commissioner Perigen. Here. Commissioner Williams. Here. Mayor Wilkerson. Here. Uh, do we have any awards or recognitions tonight? Any from the commission? And we have some comments from the city manager too. Yes. As a follow-up from our last board meeting, uh, you had provided some direction for us to seek additional public input regarding the proposed change in parking around Fountain Square to reverse angle or back in parking as part of our downtown streetscape improvements project. So we had a public meeting on April 23rd at the BGMU Conference Center, and basically it was to show the final designs, and we also had put up a board. Essentially, where people could apply a dot to signify which parking proposal they preferred. So we had about 70 attendees at the public meeting. There were 45 dots that were placed next to the current pull-in parking configuration and 10 dots were placed next to the proposed reverse angle parking configuration. Back in December, we did something very similar where the public had attended. It was about 50 to 60 participants at that particular meeting and it was a 21 uh, dot in favor of reverse parking and 10 that preferred the pull-in. So it's a reverse at this point of the majority. So those who attended, the majority of those who attended were not in favor of the pull-in or in the reverse angle parking, preferred the pull-in parking. So my question now to the board is how would you like the project team to proceed with final design? I think we should go with the will of the people. Um, <laughs> I, I might also point out that the Daily News did an, did an online survey mm -hmm. um, and they asked the question of the the general public and i'm assuming a lot of those people could not get there and i know that's limited where you can only vote one time from each ip address so it's it's not flooded but it was about an 82 percent overall um so it would be my recommendation that we uh that we not pursue the back end parking i concur all right uh i definitely concur yes ma'am I, I concur uh okay. in I, I tracked comments uh, through social media, uh, my own social media pages, as well as comments that I <laughs> saw on other social media pages. And it was uh, about, uh, and I was surprised, an 80 to 20 split. But there were 20% of the people who, who supported it, but the vast majority did not. Okay, so we will then change in our final design, go back to the original configuration of the pull-in parking. Um, so will be striped as we are normally striped. We'll change some curb lines, but it's not gonna affect the, the actual parking configuration. So we'll, we'll go back. If we leave the curb lines like we'd suggested, then you know there may be other opportunities for, do, for something else in the future and we won't lock somebody in. But Didn't we also uh, pick up a couple of other points yes. that uh, suggestions that were made that, that we might want to incorporate into that final design? And we are. There were a couple additional suggestions made, um, one being to keep a left turn off of Main Avenue onto College Street. So we are looking at providing that configuration. It's gonna take away some of the additional parking we had thought we could fit in, um, but we will look at making that turn still capable. So you'll basically have two lanes, one that can go straight and one that can turn. And then um, we were also looking at some loading and unloading zone areas uh, where there was current 
parallel parking, we're going to go back to the parallel parking scenario and remove the proposed unloading loading zone, um, particularly on the College Street side. I think we're going to leave the one on the State Street side because there's one that already exists, um, and we still want to have at least one. And then we'll have to look at some other um, direction, I guess, from the board later on in terms of policies and procedures when we want to ask, you know, delivery trucks to maybe go to back doors versus staying on the on the street, um, or we can set specific times for those loading and unloading zones. So we are going to address those areas, try to add in some additional parallel parking, um, particularly in front of uh, the end of uh, the park on the College Street side. And just, just for clarification for those folks out there listening, the, the reverse angle or the pull-in parking that really doesn't move a decimal point. It really doesn't change pricing at all as far as the, the plan goes. So it's not like we're, you know, we, were, we weren't spending any money to do it, so we're not spending any money to take it away. We were likely going to have to restripe regardless because right. we're adding more parking. Um, so mm -hmm. we'd be restriping. Right. So that cost would already be built in. That's not going to change. But yeah, as, as the mayor mentioned, the curb lines can stay the same. And later on, maybe we can look at some of that. But it's a small change. Maybe as more communities show success with that, we can we can do that sometime in the future. We may even decide at some point to do a temporary setup just to kind of see how it goes. Oh, let's not let's yeah. just not talk about okay. that right now. Yeah, we'll just they'd be long down the road. Yeah, yeah. nothing nothing current. We would just <laughs> I think maybe we, we might want to pick another trial spot sure. other than around the square. Oh, absolutely. Let's not even talk about. Yeah, that. yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. not not. Yeah. Okay. 80 20. 80 20. Yeah. 80 20, yeah. right? 80 yeah. 20 rule, right? Okay. Okay. All right. That, Thank you. That's all I had on city manager comments. All right. Did you have anything else? Do we have closed session? Closed session. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> sorry, I didn't write that down. Uh, we do have a closed session. Uh, Ashley will read the reasons for that. Pursuant to KRS 61810B, for the purpose of deliberations on the future acquisition of real property by the city, as publicity would likely affect the value of this specific piece of property to be acquired by the city. And F, for discussions which might lead to the appointment of a city manager, this exception shall not be interpreted to permit discussions of general personnel matters in secret. So moved. Second. Second by Nash. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Denning. Yes. Nash. Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Anything else? All right. Uh, need approval of the minutes for the regular meeting on April 17th, 2018, and special meetings on April 18th and 19th, 2018. So moved. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Williams. Is there any additions, deletions, or corrections? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Second reading of ordinance BG 2018-21. Ordinance relating to natural gas franchise. An ordinance of the city of Bowling Green approving extension of non-exclusive natural gas franchise agreement with Atmos Energy Corporation. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Williams. I don't think Comments? He's... All right, we have the people from West Kentucky Gas. If you have any questions with regarding to the second reading on the renewing the gas franchise for 10 years at no changes, right? Uh, yes, the only thing we're doing is continuing the existing franchise for another 10 years. At the end of the 10 years, we will have to advertise again. Franchise fee remains at 1%. Roll roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Thank you very much. I would appreciate it. Municipal Order 2018-65. Municipal order approving the reappointments of Delane Simpson and Jack A. Thomas to the Bowling Green Code Enforcement and Nuisance Board. So moved. moved. Uh, William second by Perigen. Uh, this is a reappointment for uh, two members that have served well. Uh, appreciate your considerations and comments or questions. Please call the roll. Benning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-66. Municipal Order authorizing and accepting bid number 2018-47 for Census Tract 112 New Housing Opportunities Program from Habitat for Humanity of Bowling Green Warren County Incorporated of Bowling Green, Kentucky in an amount not to exceed $500,000. So moved. Second. Urgent second. 
This item was discussed with the CDBG public hearing at the last meeting. In an effort to address options for affordable housing in Census Tract 112, as part of our neighborhood improvements program, the city solicited proposals and received two responsible proposals. Staff is recommending award to Habitat for Humanity for a project to extend the Durban Estates infrastructure to construct new affordable housing units for 22 families. Grants Coordinator Nick Cook is available if you have any questions. Questions, Mr. Mr. Cook. Help me out to get a better understanding of what the game plan is here. What What is the intent of what we're trying to do here? So we are trying to uh, increase the supply of affordable housing uh, in our community. And so what we'll what we be doing is awarding $500,000 to Habitat for Humanities, Durban Estates Project, where Habitat would use the funds to install uh, new infrastructure, uh, road, uh, utility, stormwater, uh, stormwater infrastructure, sidewalks that would be required to construct 22 new houses. Uh, this project would actually complete the road through uh, Durban Estates connecting from West 12 to White Avenue. So after the infrastructure, what do we do next? Uh, Habitat will start building the homes. Are the Homes going to come out of the 500,000 that is already designated for uh, the infrastructure? No, the, the financing for the homes will come from Habitat. Okay, that brings me to my next question. Your other bid was going to be to rehab houses and build new houses. So uh, I'm confused. If we want housing and and I certainly understand you got to have an infrastructure there. But when you build the infrastructure, it's two step. You got to build the houses. It seems like to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the other proposal is going to provide everything at the same time. Is that not right? Sort of. So the other proposal actually would be $500,000 utilized to rehabilitate 15 houses, uh, nine of which would be rental houses and uh, six of which would be affordable home ownership. So the other entity would actually be acquiring those houses and then using CDBG money to rehab them. Yes, sir, Mayor. You, you've got two vendors here listed and we've selected the Habitat for this one we selected Live the Dream for the previous 500,000 in the same area, is that correct? So Live the Dream is doing uh, a group of them and then Habitat is gonna do the other group of them. And I have no point. Jake, real quick, what the mayor's what? talking about is we had two different RFPs that we issued. We had $500,000 for exterior rehab, similar to our private property improvements program. Live the Dream was awarded the first $250,000 as part of that. That's a separate RFP, a separate contract, a separate agreement, separate funding. This one is for Habitat. We're recommending to award for the completion of Durban Estates development. So they're acting as the developer in this case, just like a developer would go out and build the roads and build the infrastructure and then sell lots. They'll be developing the, the subdivision and then building the houses on top of that. So there are, there are two proposals, two RFPs. One has already been awarded. The other one is up for award tonight. I understand that. Okay. I don't have no problem with that. My question is and my concern is if we want people to live there, it would appear to me that one proposal is going to put people there in houses as taxpayers, and this one is just building the infrastructure for houses to come later. Correct, but there is, there is a part of this that you have to understand. Uh, this is CDBG funding. The road and the infrastructure does not meet what's called a national objective. So their agreement will, will, will bind them to build the houses. You are correct. There, the 15 houses that were in the other proposal exist right now in the inventory in 112. 
they're out there. We don't know which 15 they are, but there are 15 properties that are out there. This would be the addition of 22 new houses to the inventory. So there will take time for them to build that, but they are responsible for building those, providing the money, the construction, all the time as part of this project. So yes, we're putting in 500,000 for the development and the infrastructure. Habitat is bringing the construction of 22 homes as part of this proposal. But that those 22 homes will not be built next year. We understand that time is a factor in this decision and we looked at that. And as, as we put together the neighborhood improvements program, we really thought about we wanted to make impacts in neighborhoods and what are we going to see, uh, you know, if we're gonna be in this neighborhood for two to three years, how can we make an impact in a neighborhood? And we looked at this as saying, we're going to introduce 22 new construction homes in this neighborhood. And we felt like that was a, a worthwhile impact and that's why we're recommending this project for funding. So the key word that automatically eliminates the other bidder is new? Not necessarily, but the RFP is the new housing opportunities. So when it, I want you to keep that in mind. That doesn't necessarily uh, eliminate them. They were reviewed, they made a presentation, the staff team looked at it and made, is making this recommendation. Keep in mind the new, the neighborhood improvements program moves neighborhood to neighborhood to neighborhood. We started in 105.2, we didn't even have a project like this because there was no opportunity to do this. We moved to 112, the opportunity presented itself to do this because there was still vacant land. There's still acres and acres of green uh, land over there that can be developed. And typically we do not see that in, in an urban environment. So we felt like this neighborhood, the Census Track 112, really had the opportunity to have this new type of, so we put this RFP together. But we're gonna move to another neighborhood. And Habitat won't be moving to another neighborhood. They'll be still working here in 112. There are more opportunities. This is a 20 year program. These opportunities do not go away. That's the, that's the beauty of the Neighborhood Improvements Program, the structure that we've created to make a, a system of, of, of investments over a long period of time. And it wasn't that the other proposal did not have merit, did not have value. It was whenever you compare one versus the other, this is the recommendation we're making. And every word you said, still don't understand the con uh, the way that. Let me let me say let, this. Let me ask this. No, let me ask this. Yes, sir. Why didn't we put out the bid to say we want you, the bidder, to build an infrastructure? Why did we put the word housing in it at all? The goal of this was affordable housing. Okay. That was the goal, was housing. We cannot use CDBG funds for new construction. It is not an eligible activity. We cannot use CDBG funds to build houses. That is not eligible. There's only about five things that are not eligible. That is one of them. Okay, so we cannot use these funds to build new houses. So if Habitat came in and said, well, we want to use your funds to build new houses, we'd say, no, it's ineligible. You can't do it. This is an opportunity to do it for infrastructure. This was written, written wide open. We had another proposal that was non-responsive that was for demolition that we, that we couldn't look at because it was non-responsive. Demolition would have been eligible. Acquisition would have been eligible. Infrastructure would have been eligible. Renovation would have been eligible. New construction of housing is not eligible under CDBG. So we, <coughs> we wrote this to where it could be uh, up to the marketplace to determine what is the best project here. We've done housing in this community in a variety of different ways. We've done projects where we've bought land uh, for tax credit development, where we assisted in the, the purchase of land. That would have been an eligible activity as part of this project. We just didn't get any proposals for land acquisition. I understand everything you are saying, but I still haven't reached the point to where I understand the bid other than the bid to me should have been put out. Uh, this bid is for the infrastructure, the plan. The re their response was for the infrastructure. The bid was not set up for infrastructure, but it was an eligible activity. Their response was set up for infrastructure. Yes, sir. Yes, go ahead. Did the bid list infrastructure? Is an eligible activity under CDBG. Did the bid list it? Remember on the RFP? 
No, their response did. I'm trying to think, did the RFP list it? I, I believe I, what Commissioner Denning is asking, correct ahead, me if I'm wrong, yeah. is that he would have liked the bid to say that it was for infrastructure. I can't tell you exactly what the RFP says at this point without having it in front of me, but I'd be glad to provide I that information. I would know out there, regardless of uh, who the bidders are, uh, that we're talking about an infrastructure or a new home, a rehab home, or whatever the case may be. A am I that crazy to... No, I'm not saying that. Uh, th th these, I, these are federal funds. And there's a complication with federal funds anyway. I understand so that. We, we try to leave this to where it is very open. But it would appear to me that a bidder out there, how did Habitat know to bid? Well, I'm just going to bid on the infrastructure. You got to go back about four years ago, we paid for phase two of Durban Estates through CDBG. So we have an interest in, a, in an investment in Durban Estates where we awarded them $150,000 for infrastructure for them to build four homes on. So there is a history between the city of Bowling Green and Habitat for doing an infrastructure project. So whenever they're looking at the rest of their 12, 14 acre track of going, how do we build the rest of this? I could very easily see them going, well, hey, the city made this opportunity to us about four years ago and awarded us this money. Maybe now that they're in this census track and they have this RFP, maybe they'll award us again. But we've also had a history with the other bidder of awarding hundreds of thousands of dollars and working a lot of conversion and rehab projects uh, and have an existing agreement with them now. This is not, in my opinion, and from the heart, anything negative to do with habitat and it shouldn't be interpreted that way okay. by anyone in this room or listening to us on television i am just looking at what i am seeing as a person out there in the community bidding on this project not knowing what they're bidding on keep in mind this is not a bid this is an rfp Re Hold Okay, and what request, that means is what whatever we're calling it, what that means there's is, a lot of room for misunderstanding on the recipient of the document. I don't care what anybody else says, the person out there bidding don't know what others may know. Let's say it was somebody else that was bidding besides this to uh, entities that did bid. They're lost. This request for a proposal, what am, uh, what am I going to? Ideally, the request for proposal would have identified, and I don't have it in front of me to verify, but would have identified eligible opportunities. So it could have had a list of infrastructure improvements. I just can't recall what that list says off the top of my head. Yeah. So it would have been identified that there were a list of eligible opportunities and then whichever company or whichever vendor wanted to submit a proposal for one of those areas, they could do that. And then another could submit for another area. So that's kind of what happened here. We had two different proposals that were submitted. One is rehabbing properties. The other is to build new housing with the use of our money to help with the infrastructure. So there were two different proposals but that RFP would have had information that identified what was eligible for CDBG funds. So why is one any more uh, <coughs> valuable to what the proposal is requested than the other? What makes one over the other and chosen? I think know why they were recommended? Is that your question, yeah. Commissioner Yeah. Uh, uh, why, one of why it was, is one recommended right. to this body here over the other Correct. with two separate projects involved that apparently meet Both were within eligible. the HUD law? That's correct. Both were eligible. Both uh, were valuable projects we decided to recommend one fully. 
Now we could have recommended a split. We could have recommended one over the other. We, re we are recommending and standing before you today to recommend habitat. So, so we, we are only, uh, Mayor, I'm, I'll end just in a second, I promise. So we're only, in my opinion, getting half done what we're requesting, while in a, another proposal, we are getting more than half done with their proposal. We're there's, getting there's housing, no way of looking at we're it. getting people uh, real estate taxes on the tax roll, et cetera, and et cetera. It's now yes no. we are not getting nothing. We're spending $500,000 for infrastructure, which you got to have for either project. I'm through. I'll tell you what my interpretation, and I haven't heard it from anybody here tonight, but it looks to me like that one project gives us 15 homes to live in and the other project <coughs> gives us 22 homes to live in. I, I'm presuming that's why you made that recommendation, but nobody's told me that. That is part of it. Okay. Uh, I'll be glad to answer why we are making this recommendation. I'd like to hear why you make yeah. decisions. Uh, part of that is a unit cost basis. We're getting 22 for the same price as 15. There is a, so our cost per is less. The other part of this is we're putting in 500,000, which I understand is a lot of money. Uh, we do not look at that lightly, but the total project, because then you got to factor in the cost of construction and everything else, is on top of that. So we're putting in roughly 50%. So we felt like we got a better return off our investment by looking at we're putting in 500,000 for the infrastructure, which will be our road in the future. This will be a public street, our sidewalks, our stormwater, all that stuff. We're getting that. We're also introducing two, 22 new properties to the tax rolls. The 15 are already on the tax rolls. So we're not adding anything to the tax rolls. Those are already developed, constructed properties to the tax rolls that are out there in private property hands that are paying taxes on them currently. Yes, there would be an increase in the investment through the rehabilitation of those properties, which could lead to an increase in the assessment, which could then in lead to an increase in the uh, capture of property taxes. But these are 22 new properties that do not exist right now. Right now it is a field that then will be 22 homes, which are new properties adding to the tax roll. Uh, the cost per and also the timing. We understood that we were gonna be in this neighborhood for two to three years, and this was our chance to really finish out a project uh, that we've seen here in the community for a number of years, and we wanted to, to see this project done. And Nick talked about that earlier, about the completion of uh, Regis O'Connor Boulevard uh, from West 12th to Wade Avenue. This is the completion of, of roadway. If you go out there right now, it drives out into a dirt field. This will, this will connect that entire road path through this. We felt like the, the timing, the opportunity, the 22 versus 15, and then 22 being new versus 15 that are already in the inventory here in the community, we felt like all those things were worth it to, for us to stand before you and make this recommendation. And I'll be glad to entertain any questions anybody has. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, please call the roll. Denning? No. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-67. Municipal order authorizing and accepting the purchase of two additional police vehicles under bin number 2018-21 from Gilly Hyde Chrysler Incorporated of Glasgow, Kentucky, in the total amount of $45,868. So moved. Second. During the past several months, we've had two police vehicles which were involved in separate incidences which have rendered them now unusable. Uh, so we recommend the replacement of those two vehicles. We have the ability to utilize uh, an existing bid that we did back in August to Gilly Hyde Chrysler. These are for Dodge Chargers, and they would be used for our um, CID unit, Criminal Investigations Unit. Uh, so we can purchase two additional bids within the 12-month period that that bid was awarded at the same unit price. So we're proposing to do that now. Questions? Call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes, Municipal Order 2018-68.
Municipal Order Authorizing and Accepting Bid Number 2018-45 for Normal View Drive Roadway Improvements, a Community Development Block Grant Project, through non-competitive negotiations with Scotty's Contracting and Stone, LLC, of Bowling Green, Kentucky, in the amount of $102,409.75. Oh, second. Second. Urgent, Ms. Ward. Normal View Drive improvements was also mentioned as part of the Census Track 112 CDBG funded improvements in the public hearing at the last meeting. This project would realign a section of Normal View that extends through Pedigo Park to improve accessibility to and through the park. Currently, I guess that road is divided uh, with trees and grass in the middle, and we're proposing to have the road all on one side. I think there's a rendering in your packet of what that would look like. Uh, the city received one bid which was deemed as non-responsive since not all required paperwork was submitted with that bid. However, in accordance with state statute, we could then uh, go into non-competitive negotiations with Scott, Scotty's Contracting in Stone, and we recommend a negotiated amount of $102,409.75. Grants Coordinator Nick Cook is available if you have questions. Directed at motion instead of Danny. Yes, sir. Question. Uh, when I totally on board with the project, uh, I think it's a great idea. Uh, it's confusing over there as it is now. Uh, when the road is demoed, will the property of the homes be extended? So we'll continue mowing the demoed area? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, it'll be turned to green space. However, uh, we were required to undergo an environmental assessment as part of the federal regulations and when we were uh, undergoing consultation as part of that process with planning and zoning, uh, bidding over that property to the property owners would actually be an adverse effect because I believe the property, uh, the property size would be large enough for multifamily to locate ah. there. Yeah. Well, thanks for checking on that. Yeah, and future plans could be that we'd want that right of way for sidewalk or a greenways <coughs> path that we just aren't prepared yet to yeah. to pr promote but that could be use of that right of way in the future and all the property owners because there are several property owners are going to be a affected right there if people hadn't been to the park it's an unusual setup where there are houses facing into the park on a city road that comes into it all those homes have been notified not just property owners, but tenants too, as to when the demo is going to take place, because that's going to be a significant impact on ingress and egress out of their property. Actually, we are in the temporary easement acquisition process, so we have uh, uh, sent letters to all the property owners. I've, uh, as you can imagine, received some phone calls for some questions about the project, so I've been trying to explain to everyone so they're kind of up to date on what we're, our plans are. Right. Will, when we get that and we're ready to actually do demo, will we notify the people who actually live in the homes? Um, sorry, I might have. The contractor will be, yes. And what does that mean? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle. You? All right, Kyle, you're up, buddy. And just ask, can I just add to what uh, we had said? Uh, within the city structure, you want me to go on, or are you going to tell them? Well, anytime there's a project within the city limits that's going to impact neighborhoods, we would identify and notify those neighborhoods. And, and we definitely are doing that as part of this project, especially when we have a construction project. We would need to make sure that those property tenants, owners, whoever happens to be there is aware of the schedule. Um, we don't have a schedule yet because the contract hasn't been signed. We, we haven't approved it yet by the board level, but when we have a signed project and we have that schedule, then we can better notify those property owners of that timeline. That's why I'm not asking if we're doing it now, and I understand that there's a lot of ways that we could notify a lot of people. Right. My, my, my issue is that when I talk to people who rent, whether it's a tenant in a house or a tenant in an apartment, they say that's great that the, ho that the owner of the property was notified, they but the know. owner of the property didn't notify me, right. and now you've dug up my ability to get my trailer out of my driveway. I don't know right. what it would be, but it's important to them, so it, it becomes important to me. Right, and, and typically with construction projects like this, it's a responsibility of the contractor to notify not only property owners, but the tenants that live in the properties. Uh, but if we need to, we can work with uh, Karen and NCS to, to send out mailers uh, to the individual houses, not, not only the property owners, 
but the, the tenants that live at the properties to let them know that, hey, this project is going to start on such and such date. Right. So that was, I think you've answered my question, okay. and that is you'll notify them by mail. Yes, yeah. we can do that. That's what I need to okay. know. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and we will have the proper signing at the construction site uh, where adjoining properties are located. In other words, this conversation came about when we built the famous baseball center out of Karyakas Park. People going. We didn't build it, but yes, you're correct. You're correct. That that is when this started. Yeah, we need to make sure to notify the public, and we do have a policy and procedures in place for that, so we'll certainly follow it. I, I don't recall off the top of my head if it includes signage, but we will. If it does, we'll follow up and follow that procedure. That's and and I like the signage idea that Commissioner Denning is suggesting mm -hmm. as well. If it's not already in there. Uh, I, I don't want to get into a belabored discussion about it, but it is um, not everybody checks their mail. Not everybody gets mail at necessarily at where they live while they're living there. And so I just want to make sure, since this is going to have such an impact on those properties, that we've exhausted all our possibilities within reason and within fiscal responsibility to do so, that we've notified people of the impact that's coming their way. Yeah, it's, it's also going to impact, obviously, traffic that uses that road to drive through not just those that live there so we would want to make sure to identify certainly through social media efforts we would put this information out through our news releases as well but signage makes perfect sense so we we will look at doing something like that and the part of the discussion pertaining to the baseball project that signage would automatically be put up on our property to show the neighbors owners, tenants, people living in tents, whatever the case is that the city had a project going on at this location. Well, yeah, we'll follow that policy. Comments or questions? Okay, Karen has, I'm sorry, Mayor Karen. Hello, Ms. Foley. Sorry, you? Uh, j just in the interest of full disclosure, on normal view for this project, I would suggest we would probably do a door hanger or a flyer because right. the project area is pretty tight and we could just as easily go and do that than we would to try to figure out is this going to the occupant or the tenant? I mean, just to be, just so you know, they probably, I would agree. Those tenants, we would probably actually put some 20 houses on the door. or less. If I'm doing it, that's what I would do. Yes. So just so you know. Well, and also, I just got reminded we do have message boards. Uh, traffic message boards like the state highway has we would utilize uh, we put those message boards out there as well to identify for for through traffic as well thanks for volunteering karen. yeah on behalf of ncis thank you karen <laughs> karen will be going door to door <laughs> see what happens <laughs> please call the roll dinning uh, yes nash yes perigen yes williams yes. wilkerson Yes, Municipal Order 2018-69. Municipal Order approving Year 15 Annual Action Plan of the Consolidated Plan for Community Development Block Grant Entitlement Funding and authorizing its submission to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. I'll move. Second. A period and second by now. This is the Year 15 Annual Action Plan, which was presented during the public <coughs> hearing at the April 17th board meeting, and we are now recommending it for approval. If you have any questions, Nick Cook is here to answer those. Comments or questions on the action plan again? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-70. Municipal Order authorizing the submission of an application for Homeland Security grant funds related to the first responder equipment project through the Kentucky Office of Homeland Security for the purchase of personal protective equipment for the fire department in an amount up to $17,962. By Nash, second by who? Sue Perigen, Ms. Ward. The fire department wishes to apply for grant funds to purchase eight full body personal protective equipment suits and one digital pressure test kit. The eight suits were are, gonna, are designed for emergency responses involving hazardous materials. I guess we have 16 of those suits periodically require replacement. <coughs> we're planning to do eight now. 
uh, and eight in the next year's budget. Um, so using grant funds at no local match requirement to cover half of that cost. Jason can demonstrate one for us at some point. <laughs> Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of ordinance BG 2018-22. Ordinance amending Code of Ordinances. Ordinance amending Chapter 23, Water and Sewer of the City of Bowling Green Code of Ordinances related to water and sewer rate adjustments as proposed by Bowling Green Municipal Utilities. So move. Second. Motion by William. Second by Nash. Bowling Green Municipal Utilities Water Wastewater Systems Manager Mike Gardner is here and I've asked him to present the proposed changes for your consideration. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Mayor and Commissioner Members. Uh, this change involves uh, actually two parts. Uh, the first part is changing from uh, cubic feet to gallons uh, on the rate structure for uh, sewer service in Bowling Green. The second part uh, just changes some titles that we have included in the ordinance. Uh, currently it has inside and outside city rates. We're proposing to change that to general rates and special district rates. Uh, on the first issue of gallons versus cubic feet, uh, long, long ago, uh, we bought water meters and, and determined a, a convention for that to buy uh, water meters in cubic feet. You can buy them in gallons or cubic feet. That decision has been in place for a long, long time. We're in the process of changing out all our water meters. It's part of our AMI project, uh, automated meter uh, infrastructure, and uh, we are buying gallon meters. Uh, for our customers, uh, we bill currently in hundreds of cubic feet, and that's a unit that people are not familiar with. They don't know what it looks like. They can't get their head wraps, wrapped around that. They do, however, know what a gallon looks like, a gallon of milk, a gallon of gasoline, and a gallon of water. So we're simply changing the structure from cubic feet. It's revenue neutral. It, it just converts it over to a per gallon rate, which is less than one cent per gallon, less than a half a cent per gallon. And that would be for both water and sewer rates. The second part uh, of this change uh, on the designation of special district uh, versus inside and outside. Uh, when we established some uh, infrastructure along Lover's Lane uh, back 10 years ago, there was a, a large unserved area out there. We got together with landowners and determined that the, the best way to serve that was sort of collaboratively. BGMU built a pump station that would serve that entire area including a uh, gravity interceptor. Uh, the property on the opposite side of the road adjacent to the, the soccer park, uh, it was included in that area. Uh, that used to be the Dr. Cooksey's property. Since he has passed and it's been sold, it's being developed now as the hub. Uh, as part of that development plans, they elected to do some cut and fill and, and structure their, their apartment buildings and uh, other structures there so that uh, no longer will it drain the whole way back over to our pump station by gravity. It requires another pump station, which is what we were trying to avoid in the first place. Pump stations are high maintenance uh, and they take a lot more care and attention. So through discussions with the developers of the hub, uh, we've come to an understanding that they would pay essentially outside the city rates uh, in lieu of, or in to allow us to properly cover the cost so that other ratepayers don't have to pay the the cost of maintaining those those new facilities. So that's all in agreement. However, uh, that develop is inside the city, so that's why we're we're suggesting the new uh, naming of that. Uh, so special district would include what is currently outside the city, and we do serve uh, some properties that are outside the city, and it would include this one that's actually inside the city as a special district. So I'll stop there and address any questions you might have. Questions? Just to clarify, it, we're, we're just changing verbiage, we're changing names, and we're not raising any rates. That's absolutely correct, sir. There we go. Partner, please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-71. Municipal order accepting donation from John and Linda Kelly Family Charitable Foundation to expand the scope of service of Camp Happy Days. So move. Second. Second. Second by Williams, Ms. Ward. This is the 11th year for the city to receive this donation, and it does expand the scope of Camp Happy Days to include campers over the age of 18. 
certainly want to thank the Kelly family for continuing this donation and supporting our program. Absence. Involvement. Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-72. Municipal Order Adopting Modern and Accurate Legal Descriptions of Territories Previously Annexed by Ordinance. So moved. Second. Motion by Nash. Second by Williams. Ms. Ward? This is the first of several municipal orders that are going to be coming forward in the next few months. Staff has been working to clean up old annexation descriptions which have been discovered to not be easily mapped using newer technologies. Many of these descriptions from older annexations are 25 plus years old. Um, those particular surveyors are, may or may not be around anymore. Terminology used in those surveys and the, the uh, documentation, uh, some of the references may or may not exist the way they used to exist. So we, we're trying to do a cleanup basically. Uh, this does not change the ordinance itself. The annexation still maintains itself, but it just updates the property description. Uh, we will be doing this um, as part of the census count taking place in the next several months, trying to get our boundaries cleaned up in that way. Uh, and the Secretary of State's office is recommending that we take care of these. We thought we had already had taken care of several of these issues a few years back. Unfortunately, um, they've been brought back to our attention that no, they weren't quite taken care of the way we thought. So we're just trying to clean up some of the boundaries. Comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-73. Municipal Order approving and accepting the revised City of Bowling Green new sidewalk program policy. So moved. Second. Perigen, second. The new sidewalk program policy revisions were presented at the last meeting and the proposed changes are the first changes, um, the first major changes I should say since 2008 since the inception of the program and if you have any additional questions obviously our public works director Greg Meredith is here as is our assistant city engineer Kyle Hunt. Comments or questions? Only that I like that we're updating it and continuing it. The explanation last time so we're no other questions, please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-74. Municipal Order approving fiscal year 2019 sidewalk project locations, including design and survey, and authorizing the city law department to negotiate the purchase of properties necessary for these projects, and further authorizing appropriate city officials to execute deeds, easements, and other documents related to land purchases necessary for this project. I'll move. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. Ms. Ward. Based on the revised changes to the sidewalk program policy, we've got the FY19 project locations uh, being recommended for your approval and Assistant City Engineer Kyle Hunt is here to further identify those locations. Thank you, Katie. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, again, Public Works is uh, pleased to present the recommended locations for the FY19 uh, sidewalk construction program. Uh, before I talk about the specific locations, I would, would like to give just a brief overview of, of the program as it currently stands. Um, since 2008, when the program was uh, formally adopted, uh, we have constructed just over 15 miles of new sidewalks throughout the city. Um, in the 10 years that this program has been active, that averages out to just over a mile and a half of sidewalks each fiscal year, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on funding levels and uh, bid prices. The map you see here shows the, uh, the existing sidewalk network prior to uh, the program. Uh, so th these are sidewalks constructed before 2008. And the locations in pink show um, areas that have been constructed uh, with uh, the program. So you can see that we have hit all areas of the city uh, with uh, with this program and I would like to point out that these locations were uh, selected with the uh, criteria that were adopted with the original program so this does not re reflect the changes uh, however with the uh, at the previous meeting the changes that we did propose went into selecting the FY19 locations and I would like to point out our GIS manager 
Kyle Bearden did most of the heavy lifting with incorporating those changes into the scoring mechanism. So, uh, so with all that said, the recommended locations for FY19 are Sandra Street from Potter Avenue to uh, the end of Sidewalk on Sandra, uh, Potter Avenue from Sandra Street to Morgantown Road, and a small section along Creekwood Avenue from the existing Greenway shown here in black to uh, Spring Creek Avenue. Uh, and again, since the changes that we presented at the previous meeting have now been formally adopted, those will go into uh, ranking locations in subsequent fiscal years. So with that, I will entertain any questions. This is the whole list for next It is year. based on uh, uh, projected funds. Okay. Did you have questions? I had a question. A question, uh, <laughs> strangely enough, is for planning and zoning, though, uh, related to uh, the Creekwood, uh, it, it's my understanding that there's some proposals for, for, there are proposals for the area where this sidewalk is going to be put in, and I want to make sure that if we're going to approve a change or construction that we're not then going to rip up a sidewalk that we just put down. Can you help me with that? Struggling to think of what exact location we got. The mayor on. is telling me it's on the other side of the creek. Okay, right, correct. Yes, there's a greenway proposal to connect to the school over in that area. Is no, well, this would this be new be a construction on, on a yeah. on a on a lot that is there, yeah. and I just but it sounds like it doesn't impact it. I don't think so. This is the one who's applied to take it out of the floodplain. Uh, okay, okay. Yes. No. That would not. That would not affect it. But uh, the, way, the way that sidewalk construction is typically handled is that kind of comes uh, towards the end of construction anyway. So when when subdivisions or, or new development is approved, the sidewalk is typically one of the last things that was constructed anyway. So if it's already there, uh, then what we would do is uh, make concessions for that. Anything they would tear up, they would then have to fix. So even even if it did impact it, they, the developer would be responsible or home builder would be responsible for fixing that if they did, if they did tear it up. But that, that is considered in the development process. Does that sort of answer your question? I don't know, I don't know the exact answer to your question. That helps, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other comments or questions? I would like to point out, if, if these are approved, we will push the entire prioritized list out to the website uh, tomorrow. So citizens can see. Question. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Please call the roll. Ditting. Yes. Nash. Yes. Perigen. Yes. Williams. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. First reading of ordinance BG 2018-23. Ordinance renaming street. Ordinance approving the renaming of Old Louisville Road to River Street. So moved. Second. Perigen, Miss. This was a proposal, I guess, presented to Commissioner Nash um, back in the fall, and uh, an application was submitted to our Public Works Department to rename Old Louisville Road to Riverfront Boulevard. Unfortunately, Riverfront Boulevard did not fit with our current standards, so we went back to the applicant and said, where do you want to go from there? Uh, River Street was the compromise name, and that does fit within our standards, so that's what's being recommended. Can you enlighten us a little bit on the standards that you're talking about? Old Louisville Road is not a boulevard. It, generally, a boulevard is like normal view. It has um, an area in between where there's some grassy area, trees, lighting, whatever it is in the middle between your two paths of, of right of way. Um, and Old Louisville Road does not fit that configuration. So boulevard could not be used. I can't explain exactly the riverfront portion of that, uh, but River Street was what came, came out of that discussion. Avenue runs. Something runs east-west and something west runs north-south. Yeah. Help us out. Yeah. Well, I can barely help you out, not much more <laughs> than you just did yourself probably, but uh, essentially there's specific naming rules and it relates to public safety and uh, uh, whether it can be a way or a street or a boulevard has to be the basically the grass uh, or, or landscape median 
uh, separated, uh, your, your two-way traffic be separated there. So there are specific naming conventions that we, uh, as a community, try to adhere by to help out the public safety, and that's, that's the main reason, uh, and then to help uh, uh, maintain that, uh, that uh, continuity throughout the community as far as what an east-west road, north-south, and, and, and different, uh, different road configurations. So a boulevard uh, would, would require that, that grass median. So why is that? Well, if a public safety vehicle, whether it's police or fire, uh, knows that it's a boulevard, then they may know that they have to drive past a, a house or whatever on, or a business on the opposite side of the street and make a U-turn versus just being able to turn right in. So it's kind of some of those considerations. Trying to get an explanation out there for all of those people who have a different idea of what it should have been named, mm -hmm. and uh, that that it, it's just not arbitrarily uh, possible. No it's, not, no, it's not arbitrary. Those those are defined. It is kind of a, a more of a natural national standard and recommendation of how how you name these streets, how how addressing happens, and and we try to follow those for for those reasons. Uh, for the same same reason as we try to eliminate sound alike names or duplicate names as well so it helps eliminate confusion if you had two William streets for example well which one is it so we, we try to try to coordinate that type of stuff with 911 this is renaming it all the way from where it intersects with Louisville Road correct from to, Louisville Road to first all the way to in the, state to the to uh, the US 31W bypass all the way to Louisville Road First yeah. Naming, renaming streets is a Herculean task because of all the efforts you have to put in to make sure that the neighborhood is on board, but we appreciate their efforts. And as I understand from Mr. Nash, this is an effort to help rebrand and then redevelop this area into a, a much even more prosperous area of Bowling Green. So we appreciate Mr. Hanks and his crew of working so hard to get to it to the point. Anything else? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-75. Municipal Order approving a Job Development Incentive Program Employee Withholdings Credit Agreement with Jack Riley Investments, LLC, doing business as Pink Lily. So moved. Second. Perigen, second by Nash. Pink Lily is expanding in the Trans Park and is estimated to create 56 new jobs and provide a capital investment of $2.1 million. The city is being asked to provide a job development incentive equal to 1% of the employee withholdings credit from the new jobs to, ex to maximize the 3% credit that the state would provide over the next three years. So the city's 1% withholding cre credit is estimated to be worth $156,500. Questions? for this expansion I think Pink Lily won the Entrepreneur of the Year award at the chamber this time is that correct Sue I believe that's right yeah and congratulations to them any other comments please call the roll Denning Nash <coughs> yes Perigen yes Williams yes Wilkerson yes Municipal Order 2018-76 Municipal order approving a job development incentive program employee withholdings credit agreement with Owls Head Alloys Incorporated second Owls Head Alloys is expanding in the South Industrial Park and is estimated to create 17 new jobs with a capital investment of $2.6 million. They've requested a 1% job development incentive credit to maximize the state's 3% over the next five years. We don't generally do a five-year agreement. They're generally 10-year, but this particular one is for five years. Uh, and as the city's 1% withholding credit would be worth approximately $27,400. I'm in sure quick. And I failed to mention that both of these items did go before the Job Development Incentive Program Committee, which Commissioner Perigen and Commissioner Nash uh, and the City Manager and the CFO are all members of uh, and received consensus on those. Bradford for his work and investment. Comments? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Last voting item we have tonight, we have a discussion for a presentation of our zoning ordinance amendments. I presume by Mr. Peterson. We tonight. do. Just if I could, before yeah. Ben, you step up here. Karen, would you mind to step forward and remind everyone about the BG Gov to Go event scheduled for Friday? 
I'm sorry, I meant, I, I meant to say this her. earlier and I forgot. I even brought the flyers. So everyone cross your fingers that we have good weather on Friday. We are gonna be at the Soki Marketplace. We are kicking off our BG gov to go season with a May the 4th community block party. May the 4th, you may not know, is an informal Star Wars made up holiday. And we're gonna celebrate it with the community block party. All of our city departments are participating. Folks can come out and check out a lot of our vehicles and equipment. And the mayor's laughing. I'm going to have you in the photo booth. I think I've, I think I've decided. The, the mayor suggested <laughs> no. that I dress up <laughs> for this event, and he asked me what I would be, and I told him Java the Hut, and he's <laughs> lost all composure now, and I apologize for that. Well, I, it's funny you mention that because we are encouraging folks <laughs> to wear their Star Wars gear. So, I mean, if Jabba the Hut fits, I mean, so be it. But we're encouraging folks to come out. It's from 5 to 8 at Soki Marketplace. Uh, come out, find a place to park. Uh, the whole back area there, we're going to have a set up with a lot of fun activities. Some of them will be a surprise. We don't want to give all of our, our secrets away. Uh, but it'll be, a, it'll be a good family friendly event, uh, very spirited, and hopefully that'll kick off a really nice uh, series of events throughout the summer with BG Gov to go. Five to eight, know your neighbor, you must. And that's part of what we're gonna communicate through this event. So yes, please come. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. All right, now going over to I'm the presentations. Uh, you're right, I lost my composure. I've lost guys. control. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Peterson, please get us back on track. Here. Uh, I'll try. Uh, we're not nearly as exciting. Uh, regulation <laughs> ordinance changes, uh, uh, maybe not quite as exciting as may the fourth be with you. Um, <laughs> But we'll try. Where, you gonna help me find it? Uh, we've been working on uh, the changes to the ordinance for probably well over a year now, probably about a year and a half. Uh, it's been quite some time, uh, best we can tell, over 10 years since we've had a comprehensive look at uh, the entire zoning ordinance and proposed the amount of changes that we're looking at here. Uh, we have over 400 pages in the zoning ordinance and uh, we have over 300 pages with changes so it is quite a significant amount of changes. A lot of them are housekeeping, house cleaning uh, type of changes but uh, a lot of it has also been listening over, over the past couple of years and uh, trying to make adjustments that we feel the community uh, would like to see. So with that, since we've had so many different changes, we created a summary reference document, which I believe all of you have. It's certainly on our, web, our website as well, uh, but uh, we try to highlight some of the major changes and call out summaries of, of different things and, and do a reference document, which will reference the page and the article that those, uh, those changes are in to try to make it easier to navigate the document. Uh, with that, I just want to also mention we've had two public meetings, uh, two public hearings at the Planning Commission, met with two stakeholder groups. We did mass emails a couple of times to uh, let everyone know we were changing these documents. Uh, those meetings, the Planning Commission, past two Planning Commission meetings are now on a YouTube channel that we created, so uh, anyone interested can look at that and see the longer presentation. That one is about 40, 40 to 50 slides. I've got 14 for you tonight, so we, we, we're trying, to, trying not to put you to sleep here. So we're gonna abbreviate that presentation tonight, highlight some of those changes, uh, uh, trying to give you a taste of this, see if you got any questions. So I'll, I'll uh, quickly go through that. I think this body's aware, and I think most of the greater community's aware, we're looking at a new comprehensive development review process. Uh, which it's a collaborative review process. It not, involves not only our staff, but also uh, your staff, uh, the city staff, the county staff, and public-private utilities, as well as other auxiliary agencies. And we wanna get as much input from those agencies as early as possible in the development process to hopefully have less, less surprises for the developers later, but also give the, the community and taxpayers better products uh, as, they, as the construction is completed. It's really about communication and collaboration among all the agency staff and the development community uh, trying to create a, a, a better model for us all to follow. Uh, we're really trying to create a one-stop or a two-stop shop that 
gets talked about a lot when you talk about economic development or just regular development. So we're trying to create a, a situation where there's just one or two places you can go and get uh, all the help you need. You may not have all the answers in one place, but certainly you'll, you'll, you'll know that one place to go to get the answer you need. So, so part of the zoning ordinance creates this comprehensive development review process, which includes a comprehensive development review committee, which is just kind of a term we've uh, coined that includes the city staff, county staff, uh, planning and zoning, utilities, all of our sister agencies to uh, look at the review and then recommend approval of those, uh, uh, what would be a new site development plan, which is kind of that next bullet point. Uh, so we've added a site development plan, which uh, next slide will show you replaces our detailed development plan process, creates a new site work permit, which kind of sounds like it's more regulation, but it's really not. Uh, and we'll talk, briefly talk about that. So it, right now, you have a building permit process and then you kind of have our detailed development pl plan process through the planning commission. So what we've taken is split that civil review and the building and architectural review into uh, two processes that run in parallel. That way, if um, a site review or a civil uh, issue, like maybe they didn't put their landscaping in or something yet, we don't want to hold up all of the building permits that may go along with that site plan, so it kind of helps streamline that process. All of the regulation is essentially the same, we have the same requirements, it's just streamlining and making the process more, more efficient. Uh, mention the detailed development plan right now is about a 30-day process. It basically requires the entire site to be uh, designed uh, and go into a public hearing before the Planning Commission at least 30 days prior to actual construction. That's not real practical in the, the construction world uh, because that is liable to change as you bid that project out, as you get those construction documents back. Things change by the time the actual uh, permit is issued and the construction happens. So uh, we realized that wasn't practical, so we are proposing to uh, evolve that process from a detailed development plan to that site development plan to where you would get that site development plan about the same time you get your building permit and uh, get your, and do your construction. Um, with that required the public hearing uh, for a detailed development plan, uh, we converted that into a public review like we do subdivision plats. So we didn't eliminate that public review point altogether. What we did was once the staffs all do their checklist and approve something, then they, that would be advertised as being uh, open for public review like we do subdivision plats, and then the stack would go before the Planning Commission, and if anybody wants to uh, have questions about that or challenge that particular site plan approval, they would still be able to do that, but it would no longer be formally advertised 30 days in advance, all of that, so we've, we've kind of compa compacted that down. Binding elements, uh, we, as a term I think most everybody's familiar with is in the development world, but we're changing uh, that terminology to development plan conditions. Binding elements is a term uh, in uh, state statutes that are reserved for a consolidated local government or a metro government. Um, no one we've spoken to has been able to tell us how we've started using or always use the term binding element. So in order to be more in concert with state law, we're just changing that term to development plan condition. It will work in the almost exact same manner as uh, binding elements currently do. Uh, and then all current binding elements will still remain in full force and effect and be enforced in the same manner. We'll just start calling those development plan conditions in, in the future. Public notice requirements. Uh, so this is uh, in response to some feedback we've gotten over, over the past few years. So what we're doing is expanding our notifications for zone changes, conditional uses, variances, and the like. So uh, right now, the current process is that if there's a zone change proposed or any of those other applications, we only mail letters to the properties that, would, that touch or would touch if there was no road, river, or whatever. So we're expanding that to just a 200 foot uh, buffer around that property boundary that is to be rezoned. We will capture all of those addresses within that 
requirement and they will get direct mailings as well and we will be sending those to both the owners and the residents uh, too. Yeah, so, so uh, we, we feel like that's the best way to address the uh, uh, hey, you don't know if I have enough people uh, question without going to any great expense. We can use our computer systems to do that. Uh, likewise, variances, uh, if the distance is greater than 200 <coughs> feet, uh, then we will just expand that boundary out to whatever the, the variance is for. So if it's a thousand foot requirement, we would go out to a thousand feet. 250, we'd go to 250 feet. Uh, and then we're not changing uh, any of the application. That burden will uh, go on the planning commission and we'll capture those addresses and we won't, uh, that there will be no additional requirements to the surveyor applicant on those. We also added public notice requirements uh, for historic properties. Uh, we did, uh, we do notify uh, in the paper uh, when there's a change in for a historic property for a certificate of appropriateness. So we're just calling that out in the zoning ordinance and then also doing the mailings to the, to the adjacent property owners as well. The traffic impact studies, so uh, that's, uh, been a confusing uh, thing over the over the past few years too so we're changing our thresholds to match the transportation cabinet city of Bowling Green and Warren County requirements and I think the goal is that uh, in the very near future we'll all have just the same requirement it'll be one requirement so that should eliminate some some confusion uh, that requirement will be a hundred hundred trips per day at a peak hour that's when a traffic impact study uh, will be triggered if you exceed that. But we're also gonna uh, clarify and codify our current practice of allowing improvements in lieu of a traffic study uh, or uh, to, be, uh, to be put into the code to, to allow that still to happen. Oftentimes, uh, the, uh, we already know what improvements or, or your ex transportation experts that we rely on already know uh, what the improvements uh, would likely be out of a traffic impact study so we can go ahead and uh, negotiate those on the front end and get them in the form of a binding element or a development plan condition. The alternate zoning process, uh, so we've uh, inserted a provision in there, so a choice to allow the legislative bodies to choose whether they want to use the current zoning process we do now or the alternate uh, zoning process which is allowed in the state statute. So the alternate pro process pretty much allows, it does allow the Planning Commission decision to stand after 21 days unless a request is made either from the legislative body or from any member of the public for that legislative body to hear that case. Um, so uh, then once that request is made, then either a, a hearing on the record or a new hearing would be required and would have to be, would have to be advertised. But again, the legislative body would have the choice to use that, uh, either the current process or the alternate process. And, and if, you, if uh, City of Bowling Green chose to go that route, we would figure out how that would, how, how you would want to handle those. Question? You're suggesting that the Planning Commission could approve or deny a zoning change and the commission it would not automatically come before the commission. Yes, so that's the alternate process. And so you, this body would choose whether they want to do the current process as it is now, and, and you, you take action on every, every zone change, or the alternate process allows the Planning Commission uh, recommendation to become the final action after 21 days unless you either choose to hear it, and it, could, and it only takes one person to decide that, whether they were in its public commissioner, whoever, to decide whether they want the legislative body to hear that. So yes, that, that, is, the, that is the case. Understood, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. I think the premise behind that is that probably 90% of the zoning cases are without opposition and are approved. So this would shorten the time for developments to start because we've got 90 days to get through the approval process on the city level before it would automatically take effect unless otherwise changed. So in this case, it would make it 21 days. So it's a lot faster turnaround for the developer. But what I heard is that it doesn't take a consensus. It can even be a member of the public. 
It doesn't have to be a member of a legislative body. One individual can request that the hearing be held before the elected body and it will occur. That, that is correct. Thank you. So the, quickly, the way that works when we have planning commission, whatever actions we would take that would be under this body's jurisdiction, we send a report the very next day of here's the actions the planning commission take, takes that would go out to all of you all as well as be posted on online that report and then they would have that 21 days to, to request that. And we would have to work out the details of, of what that would mean. Uh, amendments to development, general development plan, plan unit developments, amending binding elements, uh, development plan conditions. Uh, so we're, right now there's a provision that the, you have to have 100% of the signatures in that, of that area affected before you'd be able to alter those. Uh, that has created issues in the past. Uh, for example, let's say you have a 100 lot development, you would have to have all 100 signatures of that and, uh, and uh, of that development. So uh, this would re propose reducing that to 75% because there's always uh, one person that won't sign for whatever reason, maybe they just don't like you or whatever, or there is a, uh, somebody that lives out of, or currently out of the country or out of town. So uh, this would help with that. Uh, we've had this happen several times uh, over, over the past couple of years. And 75% uh, is still more than a supermajority uh, of, of signatures required. So we feel like this level would still prevent any negative effect from happening, but still allow a, uh, a reasonable amount of signatures to be obtained before those, those uh, terms and conditions would change. Accessory apartments, uh, this is in response to several, uh, I guess, complaints and or uh, situations through, through the few years, too, that we've allowed accessory apartments. There's always trying to strike that balance of allowing a, um, a granny flat or a mother-in-law suite or similar uh, situation for the owner-occupant of the house versus uh, someone trying to just rent that second unit and, and do something that, uh, that the uh, ordinance was not intended for. And so to help with that, we've just clarified that accessory apartments are for family only. The primary residence must be occupied by the owner. And then we've uh, introduced some character considerations uh, such as entrances must be on the, located on the side or the rear, so it can't be uh, developed to look like a duplex with two front doors. Um, it can't alter the character of the neighborhood or the pattern of development of, of the neighborhood. Again, uh, and then that the accessory apartment can only be occupied by persons related to the owner of the property. So some, some of the standards we looked at, to, again, trying to add flexibility and some mixed use stuff, try to get people closer to uh, allow more housing types and fle flexibility. Uh, so we've added twin homes in RS1, B, and C districts, which is our mo uh, more dense uh, single family uh, neighborhoods on sewer. So we've added uh, twin homes to RS1, B, and C districts, and we've added twin homes, patio homes, and town homes in the RS1, D districts, so that would be town homes or four units, up to four units attached. RS uh, twin homes are two units attached, but they would have to each be platted on their own lot. So again, this would be only allowed in the most dense single family neighborhoods. Uh, we've changed parking requirements to be a, a bedroom-based requirement to help with some of the issues we've had where duplexes are built, but their uh, duplex currently uh, only has two parking space requirement. But if you build two four-bedroom duplexes and rent to four college students, then suddenly there's eight, ten parking spaces, and so it was, it was creating issues. So that'll help with that, going to a straight bedroom-based requirement. Um, RS1D in the downtown area, so uh, by downtown area is basically inside the bypass ring and then from Broadway to the river is how we've, how we've defined that. We allow that smaller lot sizes and uh, that if, as long as it fits in uh, with the existing pattern of development in downtown to try to help uh, achieve a density but still have single family uh, neighborhoods in the downtown area. 
Some multifamily standards, key ones we've changed there, we've eliminated the density cap for RM4. So rather than try to prescribe a, a, a maximum density for our most dense multifamily residential zone, uh, we're just gonna allow the standards such as lot coverage, uh, landscaping requirements, parking, dictate how many units you can fit on the lot. Again, it's for the most dense zone. Uh, parking requirements, we've proposed making uh, all parking in Bowling Green reverse angle parking. <laughs> just kidding, <Yeah>. just kidding. <laughs> bad really joke, bad joke, I'm sorry. It was a really poorly timed joke. Yeah, there. yeah, That's yeah, okay. So, so uh, just seeing if you're listening. Uh, the, so within, but we have uh, basically overall less than the requirement. Yeah, yeah, out of order. So uh, within one mile of WKU campus, we've left requirements basically the same. Typically we found since we have a car-free campus that all the cars end up being in the apartments and you know, again, you have two or, two or three uh, or, or more uh, students living in one unit. And so, so we've left those requirements basically the same, but we've reduced parking if you're outside of one mile of WKU's main campus to uh, one space per bedroom plus a 10% guest provision, and that is a that is a uh, reduction in overall uh, requirements. What we found when we looked at it is we were actually over parking a little bit in some of our apartment complexes that are out in the the I guess the areas of the city that are that are uh, less uh, uh, that are further away from WKU. And then yes, sir. When you say that. Uh, you require one space per bedroom mm -hmm. uh, outside of the WKU campus. If we go over to the Creekwood area, where we were talking about the sidewalk earlier, uh, I, I get a lot of feedback about the number of townhomes, duplexes that are built over there that don't that don't seem to have enough parking mm -hmm. for the number of people that are living there. How do you define a space? So, so residential spaces are a little harder to find than say a commercial space, but typically it's the same, a nine by 18 space. Uh, so nine foot wide by 18 foot long. So if they have driveways, then they would have to provide uh, enough space for two cars on the duplexes. But right now we have that uh, issue with our current ordinance to where if it's a duplex, it's just based, you two spaces is all you need regardless of how many bedrooms you have. Right. So, so even if you had four bedrooms over there and you had four spaces based upon the driveway, that would mean you would have to stack the cars in there, mm -hmm. which most people aren't likely to do which then forces them onto the road. Right. So we've tried to uh, tried to address that, especially since most since our front setback's only 24 feet, you can't get 36 feet of cars in that 24 feet. So that's this this should help that. This is this is helping that. What would way. fix that? It would. So I guess the way I would uh, ascribe these regulations is their minimum standards. And so any regulation uh, that we create creates a box and sometimes not everything fits in that box. So we, we try to take those averages if, if, you, if you will and do that. So we think we've better addressed it as the way I think I would like to, uh, like to say that rather than fix, okay. if you get what I'm saying. Um, and then, uh, f again, for that downtown area, which is kind of that downtown TIF District Medical Center area, we uh, currently, in, a in areas zoned uh, central business, which is kind of our downtown zoning, there's no requirement for any parking whatsoever but what we've, uh, for any use. So what we've uh, found is that most of our developments that are being done now uh, uh, the view and, and others uh, are still wanting to provide at least one space per unit. So we've went ahead and, and codified that and, uh, and, and proposing to have at least one space per unit. So if it's a mixed use, you still wouldn't have to have any parking for the businesses, but you would for if you had a residential use associated with that. 
We made some slight tweaks to some of the signage uh, sizes, again, just looking at what people put up and what, uh, what they are and just trying to adjust that. Um, commercial development standards, we've tried to build in landscaping flexibility, so uh, we've kept the same basic landscaping standards, but we've tried to allow flexibility to have allow uh, developers to make that up in other areas if you can't get the 10 foot if, if that's required up front then you might be able to go less there but make it up with foundation plannings and, and allowing foundation plannings in some other areas so trying to uh, uh, allow some flexibility there uh, parking requirements <coughs> we've adjusted for many other things uh, we've uh, changed doctor's offices uh, like a general practitioner to be a professional office instead of a medical office so that sort of reduces some of that, those requirements too but we think are still adequate um, and then another thing we've added an option for a campus style signage uh, medical center may be the, the best example that comes to mind right now if they came to us and wanted to uh, do a uniform sign package that told people where to go and gave directions uh, we've allowed for that type of uh, sign package now rather than just saying no you only get one sign for the whole business so we're trying to allow flexibility there uh, made a few changes to industrial development standards uh, gravel for emergency access if there's no public or employee access otherwise it's truly just for uh, fire trucks or whatever to get around the back of the building uh, make uh, currently it requires everything to be paved we think that's a, a bit of an overreach so we've lessened that requirement uh, and then four graveled areas uh, we also have a current requirement that the entire perimeter of that graveled area has to be curbed and guttered in concrete and uh, to contain the gravel so we've changed uh, lessen that requirement to just you, you tell us a reasonable containment system that will deal with the gravel migration and stormwater considerations and and we would accept that now too a lot of mixed use provisions that we've added so we, we basically we've allowed uh, some commercial in our dense uh, residential zones uh, again uh, and then likewise allowed some residential in some of our commercial zones again trying to get uh, people closer to goods and services that would be for necessities uh, and and vice versa and that's in order to hopefully uh, get a more walkable environment uh, and start building those to where people are closer to uh, to necessities to where they may not have to take a car to get what they need uh, we've modernized some terms like craft beverage production short-term rentals and burial related uses for example we only had cemeteries and obviously there's there's more to them than than just uh, uh, more to burial related uses than just cemeteries Um, home occupations residential use changes a, a small ch uh, what we feel is a small change there general contractors <coughs> were allowing to only be a home office now instead of actually having the full business a whole lot of issues uh, over the over the years of materials being on site at the house and employees coming to the house and which is not supposed to happen so basically that's how we tried it and it didn't really work but again the contractors will still be able to obviously have a home office and conduct paperwork and that type of thing uh, institutional uses we kind of reclassified along with that parking so better to find just medical related uses commercial use changes we've uh, revised retail uses permitted by total square feet again allowing some of those commercial uh, uh, items to be in a residential neighborhood we wanted to uh, have some control over the square feet and these are these are common uh, common square feet breaks uh, square footage breaks for certain retails uh, for example your typical IGA or Dollar General market is about 10,000 square feet or less so we've allowed those in certain areas again trying to create that cor corner grocery store but in a modern sense so we've, we've done that vehicle sales and equipment our current uh, uh, regulation says uh, regular sales and heavy sa vehicle sales your guess is as good as mine what that meant so we use the the federal highway classification to uh, to uh, kind of make those determinations mm-hmm it does not have anything to do with beauty shops though is that right 
Now those will remain conditional uses. So the conditional uses, we have not proposed uh, any. Uh, uh, we may have proposed one or two additional ones. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, the, it won't affect those regulations. Those will still be allowed to be in those residential zones as a conditional use, which requires a public hearing and approval before the Board of Adjustment. But that's, that's what it is now. Commercial use changes, we've changed our bed and breakfast regulations to match <coughs> KRS 100 uh, state law. It defines a bunch of different types of bed and breakfasts and how they're handled, so we, we just changed to match state law. Again, allowed limited retail uh, sales in the uh, multifamily neighborhoods. Again, trying to get people closer to the necessities. Uh, industrial use changes, uh, reclassified recycling mulch and wood operations as a waste related use that's more probably of a county issue than anything in the city. But the second uh, item under that, uh, we've introduced screening requirements for waste related outdoor storage for junkyards, scrapyards, etc. Uh, there are no regulations for that currently, so um, we've introduced that. Temporary use changes, we set a limit of four times a year instead of being wide open and then clarified that parking and event space must be on grass, gravel's not allowed, uh, gravel's not allowed as a surface um, without being paved, but we have issues just dumping a load of gravel for a firework stand or something and then it sits there for us to look at forever, so this just clarifies that that's, that's not allowed, unless they take it, they maybe if they take it up. Grandfathering, I won't go over this, but we've uh, increased the time that that applies. Currently it's at six months, but if a structure was to burn down, uh, they only would have six months to do all the paperwork, get the check, get their permit. So we've, we've changed that to, uh, to extend that time because we felt like six months was a little too restrictive. Um, and then we've changed signage uh, also to allow more flexibility where an existing sign face can be changed if a business was to modernize, update, replace a sign uh, face, something like that. Uh, currently, they would have to come into conformity. Uh, so we've, we've kind of lessened that restriction to allow them to be able to replace, uh, replace that. A Couple things that we didn't change, and I believe this is the last slide. So sanitary sewer connection provisions. Again, it's probably more of a county issue, but after a lot of discussion, we've left that s the same requirement that if you're within 2,000 feet of uh, sanitary sewer, you still have to connect there. Uh, final action on development plan conditions or binding elements. Uh, we did explore uh, final actions for amending the development plan conditions at the legislative body level, uh, but uh, after an expanded discussion on that with, uh, uh, with the city commission and fiscal court members, uh, I think uh, the overwhelming consensus kind of leave that the same and if we decided to amend binding elements at the legislative body level, uh, a whole new uh, hearing would likely have to happen and it just it kind of prolongs uh, the process. So, so that uh, consensus, uh, uh, it was left, this, left the, as it is where planning commission has that final action. And then last, uh, digital billboards, we had proposed to allow digital billboards, uh, but that was removed in, uh, just because uh, there was a desire to not have an expanded conversation about allowing more billboards or anything like that, so that, ha that has been removed. So that's about as fast as I can go. <laughs> but yeah, again, these, the, this information is on our website. The expanded presentation's on YouTube. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, answer them or if you'd like me to address something at the next meeting, I'll be happy to. One has a yes, sir. Two questions. Uh, I, the, one of the things that I had written down and then you mentioned it is off-premise signage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you wanted to leave that alone, but I have a question related to it. And that is currently, as I understand it, if there is off-premise signage, it is that existed before the new rule, it can stay there. It was grandfathered in, but it can't be altered or improved in any way. So if, uh, if it, the only off-premise signage that is allowed currently is billboards, and they have to have a specific billboard lot. Uh, 
we make it with the exception of the campus sign I meant it, uh, mentioned. But yes, if there is one existing, it would be allowed to stay. It would be allowed to change sign faces. But if it was ever completely replaced, then it would have to be removed. So it's there are areas of town where that rule is creating an eyesore because the owner of the sign doesn't want to take down the sign and even though the sign is falling apart they would rather the sign be there falling apart directing customers potential customers to their business rather than lose the sign altogether which what they which is what they would do if they improved the sign and made it less of an eyesore mm -hmm. it, it feels like we're caught in between a rock and a hard place there so my, my response to that is currently those signs are probably in violation of the zoning ordinance. They are supposed to be removed. How but Nobody was grandfathered. They are not necessarily grandfathered okay. in. Um, the, maybe I get to say this because I've only been here two years, but there hasn't been any enforcement of that uh, rule for a number of reasons. Um, and, and so, uh, because those signs are expensive. So the cost of sign, the part you see is probably only about the half the cost of an actual sign. The anchoring, the foundation, all of that is a sign. So communities always have uh, discussions from both sides of making them remove that sign from the eyesore uh, perspective versus the business owner wanting to maintain that investment that somebody made to to do that so we uh, so that is a discussion uh, that needs to probably be had at some point because it is starting to I've noticed it myself there are there's a number of them a lot of them on Scottsville Road right now also some very big poles naked poles if you will that have nothing on them so uh, we will have to discuss how we want to handle those as a community and see if there's some balance. Um, some communities have enforced them and then given a period of time to take them down if they aren't reused, which is kind of what grandfathering does anyway, which is the six months currently, We're proposing to do 18 months, but as you're, I'm sure you're well aware, there are many that have been there for years, so we, we probably need to discuss how we want to handle that and how we would if we want to pursue enforcement and how we would handle that. Second question, and I'll be brief, is, pardon me, too late. <laughs> don't, Wait, don't, don't make job a man. I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you right now, <laughs> don't make job a man. Uh, with apartments and duplexes, we seem to be running, and I've been talking with NCIS about it, that we, we're running into an issue where they're, they're not, I said it wrong, didn't I? Yeah, I think that's a television show I watch. <laughs> All right. Uh, They're much cooler than us. <laughs> yeah, they are much cooler than you. Uh, where trash containers are not being returned from the street back to the duplexes and the apartments. And I have some empathy for the people who live mm -hmm. in the duplex and apartments because they say there's no place for them to go. Is there anything that we can do through zoning when new apartments are built that there's a designated area, whether that's a concrete pad, side of the structure, behind the structure, where, where we can designate that that's where they go and there is a space for them to go? Yeah. So, so with pretty much all new developments, and I don't know what the actual size is before they have to require a dumpster, but they have a dumpster pad and it has to be screened a lot of older apartments don't don't have that, or they've went to rollouts. Um, so you're kind of we're skirting the edge between a planning zoning requirement and then just a nuisance requirement of the owners or the renters not necessarily doing what they're supposed to do. Right. And so that kind of goes a little bit into code enforcement, uh, how we handle that, but with recent developments I, I can tell you we do address the garbage location we do try to get uh, comments on how uh, the refuse trucks can make the radiuses to pick up the dumpsters but the ones that do not have dumpsters and are rollouts then it just becomes a kind of that 
courtesy issue, the code enforcement, the, the nuisance issue. So. But is there a way or is there existing now a, a concrete pad for rollouts? Not, not a requirement for rollouts that I'm, that I'm aware of. That's the issue, mm -hmm. is the, the blue mm -hmm. and yellow carts that mm -hmm. don't get drugged back up mm -hmm. the driveway mm -hmm. and then the complaint that there's really nowhere to put them. Sure. I mean, whether I leave them at the street or whether I put them in front of the garage, they're still visible. Correct. And then whenever we went back and redid Chapter 27 several years ago, this was one thing we heard a lot from the people was everybody leaves their recycle bins and their rollout, Herbie Kirby, whatever you want to call it, out at the street, uh, which is unfortunate because we do have backdoor pickup in this community uh, where Scott Way should pick it up, take it back. Yes. Uh, but many of us still take it to the curb and then uh, unfortunately some leave it at the curb. So we went through and I think it, it doesn't have to be out of sight. I want to make that clear. It has to be back to the uh, front edge and I think we might have said within five feet of the, the principal face. So that was in chapter 27. It doesn't say here's a designated spot or it has to be in this location. It just means if you take it to the curb, bring it back to your house is really what it says. So we can and address I'm not trying to make it more restrictive. I'm just trying to find out if there's a way we can make it so it will happen. We have an enforcement mechanism and also awareness tools through Karen's office to make people aware of those types of requirements. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Peterson and his presentation? All We're right. proposing to have an ordinance ready for the next meeting for first reading. Obviously, 300 and some pages worth of changes. Uh, we'll have an ordinance with an attachment uh, to identify those changes, but um, that will be presented at the next meeting for first reading. Thank you for your hard work. Next item on our agenda is uh, public transit service. Yeah, if I may, uh, the city is the recipient of a direct appropriation for federal transit funding and contracts with a third party provider, Community <coughs> Action of Southern Kentucky, to provide transit services for the city of Bowling Green. Would you pass those? And basically, in order to maximize access to those federal dollars for operating services only, we receive $643,114. It requires a 50 50 match for that. Uh, and the match, much like any other grant program, we have to come up with the match amount. Um, there's many ways you can do that, a variety of options, uh, local cash, in-kind in donations, other grants, um, what we're referring to as maybe a non-fair revenue like rentals or advertising. Those items can be um, tallied up together and can help make up the match amount that's required. And so Community Action has done that through the years. Dr. Butler, our interim director for the Community Action of Southern Kentucky, would like to request additional funding be made available for fiscal year 2018, uh, the contract appropriation agreement, and then also for next year's fiscal year 2019 funding required to go toward the match requirement. Uh, and because we're in the process of finalizing the budget, I've asked Dr. Butler to come here to present his request. Butler, thanks for coming. Glad you're back. Yes, sir. Mayor and the commissioners, uh, thanks for uh, Katie asked to uh, make the presentation prior to the 15th uh, uh, budget pre presentation. So I'm going to be brief um, to the point. Um, two letters submitted uh, requesting funding. Uh, first request is for $75,320 to finish out the current fiscal year. The second request for funding. 2018-2019 for uh, $454,080. Uh, the increase uh, of $80,000, this last increase was to cover cost of expanded route to Lover's Lane area. And just for your information, the, the expenditures for year one were about $68,153. Third request is an amendment in the allocation of city funds in the categories of fuel and maintenance uh, for $130,000 applied for fuel and $40,000 for maintenance, which is based on trend data. Uh, now, now I know this will require a discussion with Public Works and the Service Center. <laughs> Principal reasons for this for the request: uh, the change in FTA policy, which uh, regarding what is allowable as an in-kind match, uh, leading to a loss of some some $384,000 which had been used for several, several years, 
both at the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet and at the Federal Transit Authority of Atlanta. Uh, it's my understanding the change took, took effect for 2016, 2017 federal fiscal year, and impacts local match for federal funding. Another factor, uh, the Office of uh, WK, WKU Office of Transportation advised us the contract for 2018-2019 would not be renewed which is a loss of uh, $75,000 uh, due to budget cutbacks at, uh, at WKU. Uh, this uh, will mean the WKU route will end effective May 2018. Can I ask you, what does that mean on the WKU route? We're just, are people riding Western's buses or? Oh, it's the uh, uh, it's kind of a circular route. Donna, is that correct? Yeah, yes, uh, that, that was added, added. Uh, to help access uh, students uh, downtown and other places. Now, uh, Brent made an interesting point the other day uh, when we were uh, in a meeting uh, regarding various things. He said, uh, so you, you got $75,000 uh, in revenue, uh, how much did it cost you? Uh, which is a good point. Uh, my best numbers right now would, would say expenditures are about 62,000 62, plus. So we might be making a few bucks on, on the contract, but anyway, that's, that's going to end. Uh, Non-renewable contract service with United Way of Southern Kentucky in the amount of $22,000 to provide various job-related services. That mean riding somebody to work? That's part of it, yes, sir. Uh, the request for funding is real, in my opinion, to balance the GoBG Transit budget going forward with, with the city as a grantee matching at a 50-50 level federal funds uh, and local match. Moving forward toward 2018-2019, uh, uh, we're going to review e each of the six routes looking at both efficiencies uh, and need. Uh, made a note here that the city growth is dynamic, not static. Lover's Lane development uh, is one prime example. Uh, we'll review, I will review the 2016 MPO transit study. My personal goal is by June 30, 2018, and take a look at findings and, and recommendations. Uh, we will emphasize six principles in all community action program operations, including public transit. Uh, those principles are budget discipline in all operations based on expected revenue and actual expenditure trends, cost containment strategies, cost sharing in operations where possible and allowed. We'll seek new sources of contract revenue. We'll take a look at performance measures. All of our programs have performance measures. And we'll take a look in, at public transit, uh, both in, in terms of a per performance measure, ridership, and what I call service need. And of course, accountability in all fiscal and program service dimensions. Now, we mentioned performance measures, and of course, total ridership uh, is an important variable. But equally and more important, we need to examine the destinations of those riders. So, a person going to Sky CTC for training to prepare for a job or a better job, a person in a wheelchair needing transportation for a doctor's appointment or a scheduled visit to the kidney dialysis center, a veteran needing a ride to the VA clinic for a regular doctor's visit, one needing a ride to the grocery store, a person boarding one of the buses en route to work, or someone going downtown or to the mall to shop, or to the cabinet for health and family services out on Lover's Lane needing assistance, and the vehicles assigned to BG Parks and Recreation for Camp Happy Days and summer camp. All of these are examples of the service need dimension. So in my view, the real public policy question to be answered is the city's investment in public transit worth the return in services? We look forward to continuing our partnership with the city and I'll answer any questions you might have. I got a couple, Dr. Butler, I appreciate you looking into this. I know you haven't had a lot of time to delve into all the details and so forth. Um, uh, tell, tell me exactly what has changed on the requirements. We don't get to count in-kind stuff anymore? That's correct. A lot of the uh, in-kind uh, items that we were allowed to, to account, for example, parking spaces, uh, 
our shelters uh, at a fixed dollar amount uh, FT, uh, for years that was always used as just a, a set amount FTA I mean uh, uh, then can and in FTA I think 2016 17 changed that rule and not only did they change the rule uh, the requirement was that they wanted to conduct uh, every six months uh, commercial appraisal to see what the real value of those items were and I think the last appraisal of Donna helped me fifteen twenty thousand dollars cost and fifteen thousand dollars and and the appraisers brought the value much much lower than what previously had been used had been allowed for for in kind so what, help me out Brent maybe you can tell me too what what other things were we using for in kind that was a large portion what dr. Butler talked about was the value of the land uh, that shelters sat on parking spaces things like that uh, we're also using fuel that the city provides as an in-kind uh, we're also providing uh, maintenance services as part of that as part of our in-kind uh, to meet that 50 50 obligation so our 50 50 obligation that 50 match on the on the operating is a combination of cash and in-kind cash being the cash that the city provides but also cash coming from other sources that I think dr. Butler talked about but the largest real big loss was that loss of in-kind from the property side of it uh, how much was that Nick you she tells me 384 800 384 thousand in property value that we can no longer get do as in kind Correct. we did a uh, and we we this happened with some changeover in staff in Atlanta uh, region 4 Atlanta we fought this for a number of months uh, pushing it all the way up to DC uh, and eventually continuing to lose uh, we've not found that FTA has been on our side in trying to help us find ways to replace that match and this is a, a match that we had used for a number of years even whenever we were uh, under OTD at Kentucky transportation and moved over it as a direct recipient under FTA we had used this this was the, the 16 or 17 grant uh, was one of the first times that they really pushed back we actually uh, had to get them to allow us to use I think on the 16 grant uh, to go ahead and release the funds based on the amount of match that we had available so we could at least get access to money this is a fight that we have been fighting for several months now uh, but that is the biggest real loss in the match side and the only way to stay at par is to provide cash so th there, there has to be match from somewhere uh, so with cash or in kind uh, the, the problem that you run into in the true operation is in kind doesn't pay the light bill right in kind helps you access federal dollars but it is not real cash to pay operating expenses and staff salaries and things like that but gas and maintenance still counts as in kind that is correct and that would be an expense regardless that is correct okay. so we're paying ourselves uh, we're paying we're covering the cost of that and then the value of that uh, trans community action is using to access federal dollars as part of their match it, this is as I know clear I know. as it can be I, <laughs> I okay. can complicate it more if you like but there's nothing that's going to offset the three right what it comes down to is if we want to access we need a dollar of match to access a dollar of federal funding our federal funding has remained fairly stagnant for the last several years at the 643 I don't have it off the top of my head number that Katie talked about so that match has to come from somewhere uh, they're here to request an increase in that match I'm not advocating for them we're well, here to manage but the in order to brand. access the 643 we've got to match it with 643 and Correct. right now we were using we're using the value of accounting as part tools of to principles yeah. to match to use that match and that tool is no longer correct is it can I ask one question sure. have we have we really um, looked at the value of the fuel and maintenance and make sure that's an accurate value and that hasn't we don't, that doesn't need to be adjusted with inflation or does that automatically happen or are we, that's coming through are fleet. we capturing all we can off that I guess uh, that, that, that that's capturing through fluid uh, fleet I think there's an opportunity uh, dr. Butler talked about changing the ratio right now I think it's funded at 150 fuel and 20 uh, in kind maintenance and I think their request was for 130 fuel and one and 40 in kind maintenance uh, 
the one idea that we had was just kind of making it 170 flat uh, to give more flexibility if maintenance costs, repair costs went up above the 40 that they were able to capture that. Also, the fuel goes up, you know, gives some more flexibility. Their request is right now we're, we're awarding $170,000 of fuel and in-kind, $150,000 in fuel, $20,000 of in-kind maintenance. Uh, their request is to take $20,000 worth of in-kind fuel, move it over <coughs> here to in-kind maintenance. My thought is, is it is it worth separating those two pots or just putting those two pots, making that one pot? So we decide this budget in the beginning and then dole it out over 12 months as opposed Correct. to actual cost as it, it just is incurred? have to be able to charge it off okay. at some point throughout the okay. year. Okay. Let me ask a clarification question. Yes. That $384,800 does that include the 170 in fuel and in kind? So, so the whole 384 is not gone away, but the majority, the difference between the 170 and the 384, 800 is gone away. That's like 100 and uh, about 202, 202, is that right? And what they're requesting at this point in time is 75320 just to finish out FY18. And then the balance of that plus an additional 36000 and some change uh, for next fiscal year. It's full of good news, Dr. Butler. <laughs> In a perfect world. <laughs> uh, and we, uh, Brent and uh, Nick and Don and I discussed in a perfect world, the city budget would start July 1 through June 30, uh, and we would hope that the federal match would, I mean, would say the same. It doesn't. It's a federal fiscal year is, is October 1. Actual, in terms of actual operating money we're using today, we're using last year's money because the grant application has not been a, approved. Uh, for 18 so we're about eight and a half months into this federal fiscal year and we hope to be able to start drawing it down and I, I said May uh, my goal was May but it's gonna be June or less so but in a perfect world we're trying to get to the <coughs> to compare the, I mean to make the two mat two budgets match so we can so we can do our, our part uh, responsibly uh, and meet the city's uh, fiscal year requirements. Any alternatives that you see other than cash? Brent, come to the microphone. Right now there's a limitation on the preventative, on the in-kind maintenance. There might be some, if we, that's what I was talking about, if we just set that at $170,000 combination of the two and not making one little pot one big pot just making it all one pot that might free up some opportunities for in kind then that's a that's a value that this body has provided for a number of years it's just we've kind of separated it out into two these two little two pots if we made those one it might open up more opportunities for more in kind to reduce that overall cash moving forward what about insurance insurance is is would you, let me ask you this. Are you talking about insurance, the cost of insurance? The city is providing insurance somehow to the, to the operation. Would that not, could that not be possibly considered in kind? I'm not sure I'm understanding the, the Can question. Can we insure another agency's vehicles? No, there are vehicles. There, there, are, vehicles there are vehicles that we lease to them. So yeah. we are providing insurance to our vehicles that is then further protected by theirs. Uh, that is a possibility. I don't know how we separate that cost. That's part of our challenge. Uh, and FTA being the wonderful partner in this game has been oh so helpful in helping us navigate these processes. Uh, to separate that, since we, since we are kind of covered under, a, under mainly a global policy for all of our assets, but that is an opportunity we, we, would, we would explore. I would think that allocated out figured out what it would be kind of it, it, per what vehicle. it comes down to is will they say yes we also yeah. looked at capitalizing some of the uh, investments that we've made through our neighborhood improvements for the benefit of the transit system we've built new transit shelters no 
those don't count. We're going, you know, we're trying to, to grab as much as we can because we understand that the, the cash side is, is much harder to get access to. So we, I'm not saying that we, that that's going to fix it. We think that can help. And that's something Nick and I were looking at today that we haven't had a chance to share with Dr. Butler and Donna. It was just this afternoon. I, but I don't know that it fixes the shortfall. And still, going back to my point earlier, in-kind doesn't always help you pay the bill. You, there's still a cash issue somewhere in here. Eliminate the problem and come back to us. I mean, we're not. Gonna I don't know that we can have that done in the la in the next two weeks. I think that we can research changes to the structure, changes to the model, changes to the partnership. Uh, part of the issue that we found in our meeting with Community Action last Friday is some of the timing of everything, as Dr. Butler alluded to, with the federal fiscal year, our fiscal year, a grant year, and you've got these three things kind of in these different spinning modes and trying to align those. But that's not something that's going to be done before we make a budget presentation next week. That these are uh, things that uh, we have to rely on FTA's approval for, and that's part of the frustration is they're not saying, if you do this, then we'll agree to it. They're just saying no. It's good to have a partner in Atlanta. And and it might be worth seeing if there's some other cities that out there that absolutely have, have found some ideas. Can you get me a bullet point of what you have, who you've talked to and what you've done at FTA? I've been invited to a meeting on Thursday. I don't know if I can do any good or not. Okay. Glad to. All right, sir. I certainly am not bashful uh, talking to FTA people myself uh, because uh, we're relatively new in the metropolitan operation, but still we've been, been around for some of 25 years, been operating transportation in a variety of ways. So, uh, and I know Brent and them have worked hard to convince and cajole and whatever term you want to use. and. I don't mind asking myself but, uh, and, and I would call your attention to the uh, the principles yeah, we're going to take a look at just about everything we can possibly do cost sharing and of course cost containment uh, uh, and some, some new sources of co contract revenue uh, <coughs> but they're not going to come easy I understand thank you for updating us thank you sir <laughs> bring us good Teach news very next much. time thank you so much Yes, ma'am. So let me ask, what's the consensus currently of the board in terms of um, are we are we sitting back for a moment, doing some more research, trying to figure out where we can come up with the additional funding? Are you have to do some research to find funding for next fiscal year? But I think we need to close out this year. In so, my judgment, close out this year on par with making sure what we're doing. Am I? Are you shaking your head up and down at me, or are you talking to somebody else? Okay. So. Uh, Yeah, so let me ask clarification. What does that mean in terms of this fiscal year? It, does that mean approving an, a, an additional amount of the $75,320 that they're asking for? I'm thinking we need that breathing space to figure out the best solution we can okay. to this problem. I might and okay, so, so help what me we, out to understand are we, is there something else we can do? I don't know. So the next step would then have at the next meeting, we would have uh, a municipal order that would prove an amendment to the current year, fiscal year 18, appropriation agreement to provide the additional funding. So okay. That, require, that wouldn't require a budget amendment now. That would be one of our catch-all things, right? It, Put it in the last one if we if it, it needed to be at a budget yeah, amendment. It doesn't. She's it, got contingency. I've got contingency available, so it doesn't have to be a budget amendment. But what we would need to do is amend the agreement to authorize the additional funding, and then what I would do for FY19 is present an amount, not specifically what they've requested, but slightly more, uh, no more than three percent more, <coughs> for fiscal year eight or 19 above the the 70,000, 75,000 added. So um, I know that didn't sound clear. I did. It'll be a direct match with the 50-50, right? Uh, no. What, what we would do, what, what I'm going to propose is that we take 75320 out of contingency this year. We'll amend their agreement, add the additional funding at your approval. 
that'll be the new base amount for FY18. So for FY19, I would look at no more than a 3% increase on that $417,000 total. Or would we look at an increase if that would not be the 50-50 match? You're just trying to give them I'm just some get, Just a little bit more money to get them a few more months until we can finish out the research and then decide if the additional 36,000 they're asking for for FY19 would be necessary. Does that make sense? Okay, because they're asking for 75 right now and then an additional 36 for FY19, but I wasn't prepared to provide a recommendation to give the full 36. So it would be at this point, we're, we're presenting no more than a 3% increase um, for a few agencies who have asked for increases. So um, it would give a little bit more money, but it wouldn't give the full 454,000 that they're asking for, um, but it would give us time to do some research. And if we decide and need to then provide the additional funding, we can do that through contingency next year. Does that make more sense? Okay. Yes. I okay. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Butler. Sorry to make you wait so long. Uh, I only see one name on the list back there, and I see only two citizens in here. Is anybody else? We'll, we'll just go straight on into our public comment section. Uh, Jennifer, I think you're the only one on the list. believe that bikers deserve grace. Um, my name is Jennifer Moreland. Um, I live at 1367 Clay Street. Do you believe that bikers deserve grace? The unified and family values. I know bikers who go to church. Women bikers are begging for a ride. Lovers Lane do not have a later bus. Why is that? We can prove we need one. The, you did something that would cause a hometown hero to do a story in small business development. They need help. They need to hire somebody to do websites and show people how to run the websites. I want to help them find somebody to help him in hometown hero because they are the hometown hero. And um, fraud department in the police station because cops in bad weather don't need to worry about saving people's worried about saving people's lives instead of fraud. Well, we told you we're doing this because I care in God. So the mayor, bikers deserve grace, especially women. The pedal license are too much money. People cannot afford their dream. People cannot find out about grants, so people need a break. I believe in people's dream. We have to make it easy for people to have their dream. The pedal license are too much money, and that should be changing. And that should be changing, Mayor. If you can't do nothing about the small business development, do something about the pedal license, because that should be changing. Okay, and overall, overall, I thank, I thank you for listening to me, and please do the right thing. And the suicide intervention to save people's lives, I'm doing a class for suicide intervention, and the lady changed her mind, and she's gonna do it in July, but if you are interested in saving people's lives, all you have to do is stand by me when I do the suicide intervention. Because that's what, to stand by me because it's the right thing to do. So that's, that's all I want to say because you won't do the right thing when it comes to, you won't do the right thing when it comes to the Fairness Act. But these issues, transportation, all that, do the right thing. Look in your heart and do the right thing. You know, and I don't understand why you don't do the right thing. Transportation, you're right, it's a lot of money. But people are struggling in this area. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll go on in closed session. Our next uh, scheduled regular meeting is May 15th, 2018. There'll be no vote coming out.